and women are not married. So the college allows them to come to this so they can learn. <laughs> okay. One guy told me he was 20. He said, I know all I need to know about music. <laughs> so I told him, I said, well, since you brought it up, <laughs> I said, you might, when you're about 30, you might become a man, but until then, no. You guys listen, okay, and you ladies listen. But they're going to sing a, a beautiful song, Mercy, God's Love and Mercy. Mercy, mercy, God's love and mercy that saved both you, you and me. Oh, if we had gotten justice, we would surely be lost. But we found mercy when we knelt at the cross. How many times have I bowed before God to ask His forgiveness for some wrong I have done? And how many times have I heard the Lord say, Child, as long as I have mercy, you're forgiven today. Mercy, mercy, God's love and mercy that saved both you, you and me. Oh, if we had gotten justice, we would surely be lost. But we found mercy when we knelt at the cross. I was just a sinner, just struggling along, till God's hand of mercy reached down from heaven's throne. And it was on that altar I bowed so oppressed. But God gave me mercy when my sins I confessed. Mercy, mercy, God's love and mercy that saved both you, you and me. Oh, if we had gotten justice, we would surely be lost. But we found mercy when we knelt at the cross. We found mercy when we knelt at the cross. Amen. amen. Well, if you're enjoying the conference so far, say amen. amen. This is the, I did some math over here sitting down, I was figuring. This is day number three. But, ser but message number five, if I'm not mistaken. So anyways, we've, we've learned about how to have love in our home, how to have joy in our home, how to be Christ-like in our home. And last night, we men, let, we got it had to us, didn't we? we I mean, we, and I hope, uh, I hope tonight he gets on you women so bad, I just can't wait to stand up and say, Amen, preach on right there, preacher. Uh, but I don't know what he's going to, what he's preaching about, but I do know that uh, it's going to be good because I do know it's going to be right from God's Word. Amen. And the only help that we need is from God's Word. These blogs and websites and all that stuff is just uh, not worth the hill of beans, but what's in, what's in God's Word will help us. And God, He's going to preach that tonight. So, Brother Morris Gleiser, you come on and uh, let us have it, okay? Yeah. All righty. Especially <laughs> these guys in the front row. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, I was thinking as he was saying all that about uh, you ladies and... Uh, I was thinking, maybe I need to re-preach last night's sermon uh, as he was making all those comments. And uh, I'm sorry, please let me come back again tomorrow night as well, if you would, please. I'm telling you, I, I hope no ladies were thinking, oh, brother, I'm a little nervous about going back tomorrow night or tonight, and I hope that's not the case. I'm glad you're here. The Word of God, as Pastor did just say, is our guide. It's our counselor. It's, it's the one that teaches us not just counseling, it teaches us how to conquer and to uh, be a conquering Christian and how to be a, a Christian that has genuine uh, 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 guidance from the Lord and, uh, and, and leadership for the issues of our life to be able to stay on fire for God. And so the, the Word of God is our constant help, and I'm grateful that we have the Word of God. I have no, I have no insights on my own.
You're not interested in another man's opinion. You don't need another man's opinion or philosophy. We don't need that. We need to get back to the manual. Get back to find out what God's Word tells us to do. And, uh, uh, you know, some man says, Man, alive, I wish I'd known what I now know about my wife before I had married her. Well, uh, you say, Well, I wish she'd come with a... With, a, with an instruction book. She did. It, it, she did. Hopefully you got it with you. Some lady says, man alive. I thought this man, I, when I first met him, I thought he was my knight in shining armor as he came riding up on that beautiful horse. I didn't know I was going to have to clean up after the horse afterwards, you know, and uh, didn't know all that was going to come with it. So uh, anyway, I often tease young people. I often say, you think, you think that Marriage is just such a wonderful romantic thing that you'll just sit and look at each other with, with eyes just, just twinkling at each other with candlelight dinners in front of you all the time and, and just sit there and stare at each other for great ends and lengthy time. I say, I got news for you. You'll be eating at Taco Bell most of the time. I, it really, you'll, you'll be going to the drive through saying, what do you want? Here's a taco. Eat, you know, and... Uh, and uh, you'll be picking up his dirty socks. You know, some teenage girl thinks, oh, just to pick up his dirty socks would be wonderful. She'll get over that in a hurry, I promise you. That's for sure. And uh, marriage takes work. Marriage takes work. I was thinking as uh, these dear people were singing just a moment ago, and the music is just continually. I thought I was going to preach on heaven there for a while tonight as we kept singing about the second coming and the choir and all. I mean, just great stuff and wonderful music. And I was thinking as they were singing tonight, I was thinking, what a miracle marriage really is. It really is a miracle. When you think about it, uh, how many of you went to college? Anybody go to college here? All right, all right. How many of you stayed in the dorm? Anybody stay in the dorm? You know, honestly, you know, you, you tolerate roommates. Really, you just tolerate. I mean, I got to where I said, man, I'm just going to study some. I'll study, you know, in my car. I'll go study in the library. Just, in, just get out of this room. You just put up with roommates for a semester or maybe two. Now, you may become friends and everything, but you just kind of like, eh. You tolerate roommates, but when you get married, it's God does something on the inside of you that allows you to not tolerate but enjoy and live together till death do you part. Marriage is a wonderful thing. And only God could orchestrate it, as I tried to say last night. Well, I'm glad you're here tonight. I, I, it scared me to death when Pastor said two words from the weatherman. I thought, oh, no, here it comes again. Then he says, wintry mix. I was afraid he was going to say polar vortex again, you know. That was the two words I didn't want to hear. I came down south to get away from that stuff. Don't, don't be messing with our, our winter now. I mean, come on. Now, I don't know what tomorrow will hold, but let's just enjoy it. You be back here tomorrow night because you know what tomorrow night is, don't you? You know what it is? It's Wednesday night. Don't you know what today is? Tomorrow night's Wednesday night. And it also is the most important night of the meeting. Most important one. You look forward to being with us, I hope. And I hope that you'll finish strong. And uh, don't, don't uh, bail out on us. You come and be with us tomorrow night. We want to be a help to you as we, uh, we go to the Scriptures. Would you go with me tonight to 1 Peter chapter 3 tonight? 1 Peter chapter 3, if you would please. And we'll go there first, and then we're going to go back to where we were last night. But tonight... <laughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, give a word to the wives, a help to husbands, and hope for the home. Can we do that? Yeah, you, the men are thinking, I thought you got us last night. Let it go, preacher. A word to wives, help to husbands, and hope for the home. I learned a long time ago that I don't help anybody by ranting and raving and screaming and belligerent, you know, being a belligerent preacher and berating and, and trying, to, trying to make people change because I want you to change. I just want to hold up the truth of God's Word and say, folks, this is what it says. Now, what are we going to do with this? We better do what it says. Now, if my disposition is hurtful, I'm sorry. I need to apologize. But if my position offends, I can't apologize for that. The position is hopefully going to always be biblical. I want my disposition to be appropriate and right. 
And so tonight as we look at those scriptures, may we go back to see what the right <coughs> position is. Notice if you would please, and if you can physically join me, would you stand with me as we read the scriptures tonight? I so appreciate Brother David's prayer a while ago as he prayed, Lord, cleanse our minds of the day's events and activities and let us focus in on the Word of God. So right now, in the quietness of this moment as we read the Scriptures, let's ask the Lord privately in our own hearts. Now, Lord, let me open my eyes and stir my heart to the truth of the Scriptures. Verse 1 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, I'm in verse 2. Did I give you the wrong text? 1 Peter 3, verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned <laughs> themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed a Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement, likewise ye husbands. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, Father, help us tonight as we look at scriptures. May we be reminded of scriptural truth. May we be guided by principles uh, uh, that are given to us from the Bible. Lord, we don't go to secular uh, writers. We don't go to uh, lecturers. We come to you because you're our Lord. And tonight, Lord, we come to you and say, please help our homes. Lord, what an honor it is for me to be at a church that believes in the importance of the family. And I'm so grateful, Father, that in this church, I've met some couples that love each other. They love you first and love each other. And I'm grateful for that. Thank you for the model and the role model and the example uh, that uh, many have been able to give. But now, Lord, there are others who tonight may be hurting for one reason or another. And there may be things going on in our homes that nobody else knows about. Now, Lord, you guide my words, guide my thoughts, and help us in these moments together to receive Bible instruction to encourage us in our Christian journey. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I've never been a real student of history. In fact, I used to say when I was in school, why study what's already happened? <laughs> it was only because I don't think I had some good history teachers. I will say to you that since I've gotten out of school, I've discovered some of the greatest illustrations have come from history, and some of the greatest lessons to be learned have come from American and world history. And I heard something many years ago that triggered a reminder in my own, my own mind today, and I thankfully was able to find it online, about a conversation, many conversations that occurred between, during those old World War II days, between the British Prime Minister, that master of the English language, Winston Churchill, and a socialistic woman by the name of Lady Astor. Oh, they had their, they had their bouts. And they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And they would uh, many times uh, fuss. Lady Astor was the very first female to be elected to the parliament. And they went back and forth. And one day she got so mad at, at uh, the charming wit and the capability and the oratorical skill of Winston Churchill that she looked at him and she said, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I'd put arsenic in your coffee in which Winston Churchill never missed a beat, he simply looked back at her and he said, Madam, if you were my wife, I'd gladly drink it. 
Now, there were two people who didn't marry each other, and they didn't get along too well. I'm afraid that too often in our homes, this, what I used to hear, failure to communicate is what often takes place. Some socialistic student said that on a normal day, every ma- a, 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 an average male speaks. I don't know who in the world sits around and counts this. But they said an average man speaks 25,000 words a day. And the average female speaks 30,000 words a day. Not, not much difference. But one man said when he heard that, he said, well, that may be true, but by the time I got home from work, I've already used up all my words, and my wife is just getting started, you know? And we fail to truly communicate. In the passage that we read here tonight, the apostle Peter was writing to some very troubled people. I recently preached a sermon from chapter 5 and declared that we're to cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. Peter had communicated that throughout his letter, to cast all your burden and all your care. It's a beautiful passage, and I don't want to preach that one tonight. But if I can just remind you what it says there, he is simply saying, no matter what care comes in your life, and there's no question, it is inevitable, you will have care. He didn't say, if you have care. He said, casting all your inevitable care. Casting. The, 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 it, is, it is a reality that you will have care. And the response to that care is to cast upon who? Upon the Lord who gave you that care. I'm convinced that the Lord gives us care in order to cast it back to him. And the, and the real reason, the incredible reason, is because he cares for you. That is incredible. That's phenomenal. That is magnificent. And as Peter writes Dear friends, in this epistle, he is writing to people who've known what it is to have one heartache and one trial and one test after another, after another, after another. In this letter, this is the letter in which Peter says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. But right here in the middle of the letter, Peter tightens the focus and he gives a word to wives, a help to husbands, and hope for the home. And he says to these people, there's a certain attitude that you need to have, madam. There's a way in which in troublesome times and in difficult moments, there are things that you are to do to have a joyful, peaceful, sweet, Christ-honoring home. Can I say to you, just as a quick reminder, what I said last night is that there are all kinds of attacks on the home. And I, I concluded by the fact that we as men and those as women are failing to fulfill their biblical roles as husbands and wives in the home. And it is a number one tool that the devil is using to implode and to cause marriages and homes to unravel. And I said last night, our homes ought to be heavenly and healthy and holy, and yet so often they're hellish and humdrum. And the fact of the matter is, women, wives, have a certain role to fulfill. We started in Genesis 2 last night, and I showed you where that the Lord brought that beautiful orchestration of the woman to the man, and he made his vow with a wow. As he said, I can join with her. And she was his, now here's the words that the Bible uses, his help meet for him. Many times we say the word help me, and it's almost like it kind of comes across the attitude of, hey, woman, woman, help me. You're, 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 you know, hop to it. You're, you're my servant. Help me. Help me. You're my help me. The words are help meet, and the word meet there means fitting, properly fitted for him. The truth is, uh, if you ever heard a man say, I tell you what, my wife, she just completes me. She just completes me. Well, that's exactly right, because a man is incomplete without his companion. And the scripture says right here in 1 Peter chapter 3, you wives, he speaks to them about a proper attitude. Notice again in verse 1, he says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now we read those words and they just almost sound abusive. It just almost sounds unkind. Now friends, ladies, this is not an abusive term. 
This is not an unkind term. It is a spirit that he is referring to. It is a, now here it is, it is an attitude. It is a heartbeat. A heartbeat of submissiveness to your own husbands. Keep reading. That if any obey not the word. Now he's specifically talking about a man who is not where he needs to be spiritually. Now we could clearly say this would include a man who's not a believer in Christ. A, believe, a man who is not a follower who does not have Christ in his life. Here's great Bible counsel, and Lynn and I have given this counsel to many a woman, many a wife, who has married a man who's unsaved. Maybe she found out after they got married he never was saved. Or maybe, maybe they got both married before she was saved. She got saved, now she has an unsaved husband. Or maybe she married him even though she was saved, and she knew she shouldn't have, but she did anyway. And she may come up and say, it must not be the will of God. I want to get away from it. Well, he's going to address that. It's now the will of God. It's not, your, it's not the will of God for you to leave him. Keep reading. It says that if any obey not the word, this could include a man who's a, <coughs> who's a believer who's not following the Lord. Though they may not obey the word, that they also may without the word, meaning a word from you, madam, a word from you, uh, wife, he may be won by the conversation, and that word conversation means the conduct of, the spirit of the wife. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste, and that word means purity, your pure conversation coupled with reverence. And that word, the word fear there means reverence. It means respectfulness. It's the idea of being respectful. Now, what does that mean? It means this, madam. It means you're not going to get your husband to do right by lecturing him. Did you know that? You will not, you will not, you will not, you will never change your husband by lecturing your husband. There is something inside of a man that just says, mm -mm, not going to happen. I'll not, he'll go piddle around in the garage. He'll go mess around uh, with uh, tools in the garage. He'll go uh, sit in front of the computer. He'll go join a softball team. He'll, he'll, do, he'll go hang out with the boys. He'll join a boy, bowling league. He'll get away from the house. By the way, nothing wrong with some of those things I just mentioned. But he'll do it to get away from that lecturing tongue. No man, no man will ever be changed by a nagging tongue. That's exactly what he's saying there. He's saying there's a submissive spirit that you need to possess. You're not going to win him by lecturing or by lording over him that you have arrived. You know, some lady may come home and she'll say, well, I tell you what, I tell you what, pastor had a great message today. I tell you, you really ought to go to church with me. You needed what he preached on today. Ma'am, you'll never get him to come to church with words like that. Never, never. That's not going to work. Lecturing and lording, acting as if you have spiritually arrived. And you'll not win him by leaving him. Peter makes no reference to leaving your husband. He says there is a submissive attitude. Now, wait a minute. What does the word submissive mean? It's referring to a proper order. It's the attitude of God's order for proper function. Can I remind you, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ was submissive. To his heavenly father. Now, let me ask you something. Is Jesus less than God? No. He's equal with him. In fact, Philippians 2, uh, Jesus, it was said of the Lord Jesus, who thought, who, uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, what in the world does that mean? It means this. He didn't leave heaven hanging on to his throne, kicking and fussing, and saying, I don't want to go. I don't want. No, he, he went. Submissive. He was submissive. My friends, the word submission is a word and term that just, maybe it's been mishandled by preachers causing some ladies to be scared of it. Maybe it's been just a misinterpretation on your part. Folks, we live in submission every day. Citizens should be submissive to police officers. For further reference, drive down the highway and watch people when they see a trooper on the side of the road, all the cars go, mm -hmm. they start slowing down. I get tickled at that so much, it's hilarious. Why? We're submitting to the speed limit. And we're submitting to a police officer. 
A student in a college is submissive to a professor, or should be. And if they're not, they soon find themselves in another school. I mean, students are submissive to a teacher. You want your children to be submissive to your leadership as a parent. I used to play football. And uh, the old sticker, you know, that sometimes a man puts on, his, on the bumper of his truck, uh, the older I get, the better I was. It seems like sometimes the stories get really a little far-fetched. But I can remember playing football. Sometimes I'd get in the huddle. Occasionally, through the years, I got to play quarterback. And that was a guy who was calling the play. And I'd get in that huddle, and I'd get, I'd get you know, I'd, I'd call the play. Many times, I called the play that I was told to run from the sideline, you see. But many times, I, I could make my own choice, and I'd get in the huddle, and and, and sometimes, uh, maybe, did, 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 was I playing quarterback because I was the best athlete in that huddle? Oh, not on your life. Not on your life. Usually the running back was a lot more of an athlete than I ever was. He was faster. He was stronger. He was quicker. He could respond to things. I mean, he was hard to bring down. I, he was a better athlete, but I was the quarterback. Uh, was I the fastest guy in that huddle? No. Was I the toughest guy in that, court, in that huddle? Never. I mean, I'd get in that huddle, and sometimes before I called the play, uh, the receiver would say, I can outrun that guy guarding me. Just throw it deep. I'll get it. The running back would say, just give me the ball. Nobody's going to bring me down. Maybe one of the linemen that look, you know, looked like Bubba, uh, he'd say, he'd say uh, by the way, if your name is Bubba, I, 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 it's, I forgot I was in the South. It's a wonderful name. Wonderful name. Wish my name was Bubba. I really do. Don't be mad at me. Some guy in that huddle would say, I can move my guy. He's, he's, no, he's, just a, he's a piece of cake. I can move him. Just give, just give, a, uh, give a John John the ball. He can come right through me. And I'd listen to all that. I'd listen to the lineman. I'd listen to the receiver. I'd listen to the, I'd listen to the running back. And you know what I'd do? Then I'd say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And I'd call the play. What's my point? The point is this, madam. To be submissive in your home doesn't mean I never get to say anything. I can't ever give my opinion. Oh, no. Wise is the husband who, as the quarterback of the house, will say, sweetheart, what do you think is best? Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. Okay, here's what we ought to do. Let's do this. You think that will work all right, sweetheart? You're a team. <laughs> You're teammates. The idea of submission is not, is, <coughs> is not some let down. It's a spirit. It's an attitude. So first of all, it's an attitude. Second of all, he speaks of adornment. Look at verse 3. Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. Somebody says, yeah, that's right, brother. A lady should never fix her hair. That's not what it's saying. And she never should wear jewelry. That's not what it's saying. If you follow that, read the whole verse. Plaiting the hair, putting on gold, or putting on clothes. Okay, what are you going to do with that one, pal? No, no, make yourself beautiful. Fix yourself up. But what he goes on to say, if you'll notice in verse 4, he says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. In, in that which is not corruptible. What does that mean? It's not perishable. Did you know that the inner beauty of a woman, the inner beauty that is developed on the inside is imperishable. That's what it's saying. It never goes away. Now, I tread on... Thin ice here. But the outward beauty, okay, we know what time does. Okay, let me start with men first. You know, man has some big muscular frame, and it all moves downstairs. You know, after a while, and it just kind of comes out in the midsection, you know. Okay, that's what father time does. And all of a sudden, a head of hair goes to his ears and his nose. I mean, it leaves his head, okay? You got the point. Okay, so ma'am, ma'am, don't get mad at me. Uh, time does something for you too. You know, you, you just take a look at your old high school yearbooks and remember what size clothes you used to wear and on and on we could go. Okay, enough of that. My point to you tonight, I'm going to be in real trouble here. My point to you tonight is this. He says here, let your adornment be that which begins on the inside of you. Let your beauty be that which is adorned by your intimate Walk with God. Man, did you know the best thing you can do for your husband? Best thing you can do is walk with God. 
Did you know the best thing you can do for your children is not just have a wonderful meal on the table and a nice clean house, though those sort of things are great, though, though the adorning of hair and the fixing of your life is, is all appropriate and beautiful and right to be done. I believe that God's people ought to be appropriate and, 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 and uh, in accordance with, with, uh, with fashion of the day. I think that's a very appropriate thing within the realm of modesty. But may I remind God's people tonight to understand something. That it all begins from what's going on on the inside. There's an inner adornment that he's referring to. The inner beauty is more important. So he refers to our attitude, your attitude. He refers to your adornment from the inside. And he refers to your activity. Notice, please, uh, verse, uh, verse 5. He says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, here it is, being in subjection, unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, <laughs> calling him Lord. You say, now wait just a second. Are you, think, are you, are you going to tell me that I'm supposed to call my husband Master, Lord? Is that what, am I supposed to do that? Yeah, no, that's not what it's saying. You don't bow down when he walks in the door. That's not what it means, all right? Look at verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well. What, what's the point? The point is her activity. When it says that she called him Lord, would you let me tell you what it means? It means simply this. She did deeply respect Abraham's decisions, and she served him. She served him. That's, that's what it means. Her activity was one of service. Some lady says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll obey my husband, I did, but I'm just, you know, well, there are, there are lines that I will not cross. I understand biblically what you're saying. But can I remind you of what Sarah was told to do by Abraham? Just, just tell a lie, Sarah, and tell people that you're my sister, you're not my wife, I'd like to stay alive. Okay, culture might have been different in those days. I realize that Abraham could have been easily killed by the kings. But do you realize what Sarah did? Without argument, without fussing, she did what he told her to do. She served. There's a spirit of submission. There is an attitude that he's referring to. There is an adornment that comes from the inside. And there's an activity of service to her husband. Would you now go to, with me to Ephesians chapter 5 where we stopped last night? In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul was giving great counsel. And there's a whole lot more written to the husband than there is to the wife. But madam, ma'am, dear wife, and future wives tonight, notice what it says in verse 21. Speaking to both parties, submitting yourselves one to another. I'm in chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. As unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. See, it just keeps coming back to the husband. As himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband, Sarah, called Abraham Lord. In Ephesians 5 and verse 33, it says here, see that you wives reverence your husband. And the word means respecting. Hold him up in high regard. Ladies, can I just get you to understand something? Inside, that big, muscular, evidently self-confident man who can maybe run a business and, and solve problems and repair things, and he's a man's man as you see his life. Do you know what's on the inside of that man? A little boy. And did you know that the way God has wired a man is that he responds to your reverential respect of him. But the moment he feels that he's lost your respect, he loses his confidence. You see, there's not a lady in this room, there's not a lady in this room who does not want unconditional love from your husband. You want your husband to love you when everything is going great and when everything's not going great. I mean, you, you, you almost want to remind him, you remember you said, for sicker, 
and for richer or poorer. And remember, I'm not the young lady you married many years ago. Okay, you don't say that, but you get the point. You want, you want unconditional love. Well, I got news for you. You need to give him unconditional respect. Did you know that any man will tell you that if the whole world, I mean everybody in the world was coming against him, and I mean the whole world was attacking him, and everybody at work was against his position, and everybody didn't like it, the boss didn't like his efforts, and I mean it just seemed like everybody was against him. If it just seemed like everybody was coming after you as a husband, did you know that your husband, as long as he knows that his wife believes in him and she stands with him, you know what that man says? Bring it on! But the moment he looks at her and she's looking at him like, man, you kind of deserve it. That's when the whole world truly crashes in on him. You see, ladies, I'm sorry. But there's just, you just I don't think you understand the power of your voice. I don't think you understand. I, I'm, I just, I mean this. I, I can remember calling Lynn when we were in college. She, had, she lived in town and I was in the dorm. Here I was probably in the best physical shape I was ever in when I was in college. I mean, I was playing ball and so forth and everything. <laughs> Here she was, cheerleader for our team. And uh, I, uh, I sat there and looked at that phone and looked at her phone number back in the days when you had to uh, uh, do this on, on the phone, you know, and, and pick up the hand. Uh, young people, just Google this. Maybe there's pictures online. You can see this. And, and uh, I, uh, I sat there, and I mean, this is embarrassing. Lynn knows this is true. I took a three by five card, and I wrote things down on that card, what to say in case I run out of things to say. I mean, I'm just telling you, I was nervous, you know, and uh, I, was, I just think, oh, man, she's way out of my league, way out of my league. And I just thought, what am I going to do here, you know? And so I, I, uh, I, I called and dialed the number. I don't remember if a sister of hers or her dad or somebody answered the phone, mother or somebody, and I said, could I, could I speak to Lynn, please? Sure, just a second. I swallowed hard. Here I am, you know, trying to get ready, and all of a sudden she says, now my wife's a true Southerner. I mean true Southerner. Grew up down in Florida. I mean, she, she, can make, she can get more syllables out of one-syllable words than, than most of you. I mean, she can stretch. I mean, just the truth. You understand. She understands you. You understand her. She said, hello. I couldn't see my card. I lost track of who I was. I didn't know what to do. I just had to invite her for our first date together. A, a boy plays ball. Why? Because he loves to play sports? Sure, many times. But I'll tell you something else why a lot of guys play sports. So that when that game's over with, he comes over to that sideline, and there's that, that girl. You were great. No, I wasn't that good. Just ran for 195 yards, that's all. That's all. Did you hurt yourself? Nah, I'll walk again. He'll be all right. Do you know that your husband still needs that favor? I'm sorry, that the, that's the way we're wired. I, I'm just telling you. Amen. Ladies, is there any woman in this room that doesn't enjoy hearing your husband say, I adore you. I love you. You're the joy and love of my life. You never get tired of hearing that. Well, your husband never gets weary with hearing you say, I'm so glad you're my husband. I don't know what I'd do without you. You're the greatest. I'm trying to give you a word to the wives and hope for the home tonight. Ladies, the Bible says in Proverbs, listen to this. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs 14 and verse 1, a wise woman builds up her house, but a foolish plucketh it down. She does it with her mouth cantankerous, nagging woman. In that Proverbs 31 passage, we read of that lady who, who she, she works to take care of the home and her husband rises up and he calls her blessed because of her honest, continual support of her home and of her husband. And I understand, so often in your frustration, 
wanting your husband to become the leader that you want him to be. You just want to try to kind of nudge him along and try to help him a little bit down the trail to get down that pathway that you feel like he's supposed to be walking. And as you verbally do that, you drive him further away. Because the fact is your criticism and your lack of interest in him and what he does withers his confidence. Your harsh words, your uncaring words weaken him and cause him to retreat from becoming the leader you really want him to be. And the more dominating and the more controlling and the more nagging, the less chance you'll ever get the husband that you really want. Fact is, your job, ma'am, is to love your husband and respect him. Let God change him. You get attention, you give attention to yourself. Don't sit around and say, I tell you, I wish he'd change it. I don't know why. Maybe I ought to just tell him that I just don't really appreciate it. Now, there are times when discussions need to be taking place in a home, but it's taking place with the attitude of, with a servant's heart, with a submissive spirit, with an attitude of let's solve the problem, and, and you ought to be approachable, and sir, you ought to be an approachable man, realizing that your wife truly wants to help you. And ma'am, you ought to be approachable too. And families, uh, husbands and wives ought not be in such a way that in the very moment that something comes up that's maybe a little questionable, there is an explosive turmoil in the home. <laughs> Can I remind you, according to Ephesians 5 here, that I see three things quickly that are needed in our homes. I say both to husbands and wives, we need to give each other attention. Give each other attention. Notice, please, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. And every man knows what that's all about. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The word nourish there means he feeds it. And every man knows what that means. And he cherishes it. That means he makes it comfortable. Uh, uh, here's, a, here's a translation. It means uh, nachos and a lazy boy recliner. All right, that's what it means. Feeding himself and relaxing in a lazy boy recliner. Every man knows what that's all about. You remember, sir, you used to say when you were dating your, your future wife, you used to say, I'd walk a million miles for just one of your smiles. Now she can't get you out of the lazy boy to come over and open up a jar of pickles. She has to bring it on there to you because you're just too lazy to get up and help. Ma'am, you used, you used to spend three quarters of a day preparing a meal with your mother's help, thankfully. And you, 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 you prepared a delicious meal because he was coming over. Ooh, I wanted to know that I can cook with mother's help. I, I want him to know. And, and, and as he came over, you almost sat there and all you just wanted to do was watch him eat. Now, if he can't nuke something in the microwave now, he may not get anything to eat in these days. Now, there's nothing wrong with a lazy boy recliner, and there's nothing wrong with a microwave. But my point to us tonight is this. Nourish, cherish, give attention to each other. The wife, see that she reverence her husband. We don't even have time to go to Titus chapter 2 in which the Bible teaches in the local church setting, the older wives ought to be teachers of the younger wives how to love and care for their husbands. That's exactly what the scriptures teach ladies to do, to teach how to care for their husbands, give each other attention. How do you do that? By, by observation, by looking at each other. Take time to look at each other. Talk. Lynn and I, in our early years of ministry, honestly, we, we had ministry in which I, had to, I went to the office every day, and I was busy, and I had events and activities. We had small children going up in the home, and she had activity uh, with the kids, and I'd come home, and I would try to invest time with her, and especially with, uh, with the boys, helping her with the children, depending on what they, their age were, was. And, 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 and we went, went through those years, and, and now our boys are grown and gone, and the Lord, uh, 14 years ago, uh, ushered me out into full-time evangelism, and I mean to tell you, Lynn and I are almost every day together, and we are loving it. 
Well, the truth is, it's because we have time for each other. We get to observe one another. We get to look at each other and talk with each other. But some of you may have to work a little harder at it. Because of the busyness of your schedule and the activities of jobs, many times men and women work, and you come home, and, there's a, and the, you, you approach each other, and you're worn and weary, and uh, as you get to the house, there is a, there is a, there's other things that have to be done. You have special services at church. You've got to come out for and bang, 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 move, 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 go, go, go. And you may have to just absolutely stop what you're doing and spend time with each other and have an old-fashioned date every once in a while. I called my son one day who he and his wife and children, they had two kids at the time, lived in Pennsylvania at the time. And I just called him just to see what was going on. No particular reason. I called him and he answered the phone with that sound of rush in his voice, that frantic rush. He said, uh, uh, yes, dad. Hello, dad, what you need? I said, whoa. I said, nothing, son. Just call and see what's going on. What's happening? Well, he said, he said, Carrie, that's his wife, Carrie and I are just, uh, we're just, we're, he said, Dad, we're having a date. We're having a 15-minute date. He said, we got, a, we got babysitter and everything. Take care of the girls while we're out. We're just, we're, we're not going anywhere. We're just driving around. We haven't had any time to talk with each other. We've just got 15 minutes to spend time. I said, bye. He said, no, 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 Dad, what do you need? I said, I don't need anything. You, what, what I need is for you two to talk. You got two little kids, talk. And then my thought was, as we hung up, how do you pay a babysitter for 15 minutes? I mean, you know, do you ask her if she's got change for 50 cents? I mean, I mean, I don't know. How do you, how do you pay someone for 15 minutes? I don't know how that worked. But my point is, I enjoyed the fact that they were just wanting to get away and spend some time with each other. Sometimes you may have to be creative with your schedule. Give each other attention by observation. And by concentration, sir, this is not giving your wife attention. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Because again, as I said on Sunday, you're going to hear this. Are you listening to me? Huh, huh, what, what? I said, are you listening to me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. What did I just say? You know, you're in trouble. You, I mean, you're ahead at that point. Look at each other. Clarify concentrate, observe, give each other attention, work at it. Not only give, should you give each other attention, I believe that you ought to give each other assistance. I believe it's teaching us here to assist one another. When it says here, nourish and cherish her, the idea there is that once again, there's activity. There's activity. Mister, you are to care for your wife and the concerns and the cares of her needs. If you get up to get a cup of coffee and she's in another room, did you ever think that maybe she might need a cup of coffee too? Do you ever think that maybe, maybe you can get something for her? Did you ever think that maybe she could use some assistance with the dishes? Maybe, maybe vacuuming a carpet? Change a diaper? You better learn how to do that. Of course, nowadays, I think it's just throw it away, put a new one on. I mean, back in our days, you had to go to college to learn how to put on a diaper. You had to use a drill gun. I mean, I mean it's just kind of unbelievable. Nails and hammers. I mean, it's just unreal. It's so simple to raise a kid these days. Assist your wife. Ma'am, reverence your husband. As I reminded you over in 1 Peter 3, serve your husband. You say, well, what does that mean? Get interested in his world. You say, well, I don't know anything about cars. You don't have to find out, you know, how to put together a car and repair one. But maybe go sit in the garage while he's working on it and just be a good talker, be a good listener. If he needs you to hand him a screwdriver or you hand him a wrench, it's okay, you know, at least you get to be together. I don't know. Be interested in his world. Find out what he's been up to. You say, well, he never talks. I understand. But the fact is, if you will continue to express an interest in his life and quietly serve him, remember 1 Peter 3, without a word, he could be won, changed. The idea there is turned around. Just be there. Did you know that when your husband gets a taste of that servant spirit, he's going to be interested a lot more in you and in some cases, your Lord. Here's the deal. 
Scriptures is teaching us to give each other attention, give each other assistance, and then thirdly, give each other affection. You remember that? <laughs> Some of you may have to really go back in your thoughts way back when. Affection. You say, uh, yeah, I know, I know what that's all about. Yeah, right. Do you have a pet name for each other? You say, yeah, would you like to hear it? Don't have any desire at all. Have no desire to hear your pet names for each other. We love the South. Lynn and I actually ate at a restaurant where this frequently happens. We ate there today, though this didn't happen today. But sometimes when you walk into a certain restaurant, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but you can get crackers out of their barrel. But anyway, as I, sometimes when you eat there, the waitress will come over and say, what do you have, sweetheart? Mm. I'm not your sweetheart. And then she, gets it. she says, okay, hon. <laughs> you say, well, she's just being nice. She's just having southern hospitality. Yeah, she's looking on a tip, too. I know what she's working on. No, I, one day we drove through a Chick-fil-A to get my diet Dr. Pepper, and we drove up there. And, you know, usually at a Chick-fil-A, they give it to you, and you say, thank you. They say, my pleasure. Well, this day, <laughs> I got a little more than that. I said, thank you. And she said, my pleasure, doll. No. We drove on. <laughs> Lynn looked at me and she said, doll. <laughs> I'm not anybody's doll. I'm not anybody's sweetheart. And my wife is not anybody's sweetheart. It's, she's just mine. That's it. Right. Right. Show each other affection. I said it to you one of these services and I'll say it to you again. Men never, ever, ever, never, never flirt with another woman. But never stop flirting with your own. Do you know that little book in the Old Testament that no preacher ever preaches through, as I've mentioned? Song of Solomon? You say, why not? Just read it sometime. It'll explain itself why you don't go verse by verse through it. You know what that whole account is? Song of Solomon is an account of a young couple who were espoused to one another. They were engaged, and then later on in the book, they were married. And the whole book, you know what it is? It's the two people conversing with each other or about their companion to other people. That the whole book is their conversation. You know what their conversation is? It's affectionate. You say, really? Yeah, go read it. I mean, it's just a, it's a word. That they, they speak, they spoke abundantly about each other. When was the last time you spoke favorably and abundantly to your wife, to your husband, or to other people about your spouse? They spoke abundantly. They spoke agreeably. You know what that means? They were positive toward each other. They were gracious. It's an amazing thing. When a, when a couple's dating, they're just so kind, and, they just, and, they, and he'll, she'll laugh at everything he does. And he does the same thing after they get married. It's like, well, pick it up. I'll marry you. And there's, all the agreeableness is gone. You ever gotten stuck in one of these conversations where you come to church, and, and one of your buddies stops you, and he, and he says, I drove by old Joe's house the other day, and he got him a new truck. And uh, he said, yeah, last Wednesday I drove by there. It's a really good-looking truck. And the wife, his wife says, it wasn't Wednesday, it was Tuesday. He says, no, it was Wednesday. I know, because I was having to get home to get ready to come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. She says, no, it was Tuesday. You told me on Tuesday. It was on Tuesday. Well, he looks back at you, and he says, well, Tuesday, Wednesday, I don't know. Anyway, he's got a good-looking red truck. And she says, it's not red, it's maroon. <laughs> red, maroon. Something like that. Well, she says, you need to get it right. And by the time you hear the story, you got two stories. You ever been stuck in one of those conversations? And somewhere about midway through it, you want to look at both of them and say, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Why in the world do husbands and wives try to one-up each other and argue back and forth and make the, make the other one look foolish to somebody else that's a, an acquaintance, a friend, or even a stranger? Yeah. Speak agreeably. She, he ought to be the hero in your life. And she ought to be the exalted queen of your heart. Amen. Quit speaking harshly to each other. S quit speaking negatively. Oh, my old wife at home. She, I got to get home. You know how the women folk are. 
What are we doing? We are unraveling thread at a time our own home. Speak abundantly to each other. Speak agreeably with and about each other. And speak affectionately toward each other. Don't, don't speak judgmentally. You say, what do you mean? Don't, don't look at each other and say, I told you that was going to happen, didn't I? I don't know why you don't listen to me. You, you know, you, you never fill in the blank. Or you always fill in the blank. Speak with a judgmental spirit. Well, what were you thinking? You forgot again, didn't you? Did you go over budget again? You want joy in your home? Quit speaking judgmentally. Secondly, don't speak historically. You say, uh, did you mean hysterically? No, historically. Quit bringing up stuff that happened somewhere in the past. Ladies, quit opening up the file drawer of your brain and say, I remember in 1984, husband can't even remember what happened eight or four minutes ago, much less back in 84. Either you forgive him or you don't. Let it go. Quit bringing stuff up. Don't speak historically. Don't speak intimidatingly. You say, like what? Well, don't be a bully. And I'm saying this to both men and women. Some man comes home and he says, Psh, if I'd known you was going to act like this, I'd stay at the office. Now, that's being a bully. Quit intimidating your wife and scaring her. And don't look at your husband and say, don't you ever do that in my presence again. Don't you ever. If you do that again, I'm going to go home to my mother. Don't, don't intimidate and be a big bully. Don't do that. And don't speak critically. You say, well, like what? Well, quit, quit crit, crit, critiquing your wife in any number of ways. You know. Why don't you ask that woman up at church? She can really cook a... I, mean, I tell you what, she had a good meal last time we had that potluck. You, you could learn something. Her. Sir, don't do that. You know, you don't, you don't cook biscuits like my mother. Well, you'll be eating with your mother again if you keep talking like that. <laughs> you don't make biscuits like my mother. She'll come back and say, well, you don't make dough like my father. How about that? <laughs> now, we're laughing. This is a little close to home. Why don't you go over there and ask him how he takes care of his yard? He sure always has a much better yard than you ever get. Ma'am, you are absolutely harming your confidence, your husband's confidence. Don't go there. Don't speak critically. And don't speak self-righteously. You say, what do you mean? Don't act like you have arrived spiritually. This Bible is a sword let it do its work in either your husband or wife's heart. It's not a billy club. Don't go home and say, you know, the Bible says. Did you, did you hear that preacher tonight? Well, I've got copious notes. Let me show you everything that I saw here. And, I, and you know, you really need to follow these things. Don't, no. You work on yourself and let God do any changes he needs to make in you. It was... Um, it was in the late 70s, early, I don't think it was 1980 yet, because it was the first election of one of the finest presidents, Ronald Reagan, we've ever had. The camera one day fell across Ron and President, future President Ron Reagan and his wife, Nancy. They were in some room, and I think he was about to step out Possibly, I think it was for the national convention in which he would accept the nomination to run as president for that party. The camera just happened to catch them in a waiting room area. I'll never forget. The camera fell across Ronald Reagan down, I think, on his knees beside Nancy Reagan, and he was straightening out her necklace. And he was just being real affectionate. This is the future president, former governor of California, great leader. And he's just, and he's 
talking to just words that only she and he can hear. And I remember for, I will remember forever, Lynn said, Morris, look, Morris, look at that. He loves her. And it was so obvious. I thought about it again. When President Reagan died and the cameras took pictures of her as she leaned over and put her hands on that casket draped by the American flag and whispered something to the memory of her husband that she had devoted her life to. Now those are people who I hope he knew our Lord. I believe he did. But about three years ago, Lynn and I had to say goodbye to her mom and dad. Her dad had macular degeneration. He was unable to see. He had not been able to see for quite some time. Family had to drive him around. When Lynn's mother got so ill, she had to be in hospital care and under nurses' watch care constantly. We walked in the room. After being out of town, we came in one day. And I saw that loving, caring husband lean over. He couldn't see because of macular degeneration. But he had his wife's hand, Lynn's mother, as he patted her hand. And I can see him whispering something. He couldn't make eye contact, but he whispered something to her. He was saying those sweet words that a husband and wife ought to say to each other. And she was not talking much because of illness. She was just looking at him. And I thought to myself, that's the way I want to go out. Faithful to my Lord. Faithfully in love with that lady right down there on the second row. Our homes ought to be a taste of heaven. So a word to the wives tonight. Help to the husbands. Hope for the home. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, help.